Node Pink and the Children of Debouncing. Sounds like some crazy Harry Potter movie, doesn't it? It's not. It's section five of the H4 plugins videos. Continuing to look at GPIO. We saw in the last video, and if you haven't watched it, you should, because this will make a lot more sense, that we have a debounced object, which takes um, this messy stream of ones and zeros. And if we treat it like a black box, we don't know what goes on. It doesn't matter, but it spits out a series of bits that are a clean transition. Now then, we also saw that we had a filtered black box. If we take that same set of inputs here, that messy one naught, one naught, that will get filtered on the highs as one one. Now then, I want to come with me on a journey, a leap of imagination, and instead of taking the output directly from the switch, let's design these black boxes so that they can take their output from another black box. So if we move that one up there, it's only got one zero coming in, so it's only going to emit the one. So when you look at the whole thing as a kind of pipeline heading towards the eventual destination of the processor, your code, we get something where we can stab a tact button up and down, and we just get a single one signal coming to our code. So think of like a, a game console, like a, a, an arcade button. And that's the fire. That's, that's what you're going to kill the space invaders with. Ping, 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 ping. Every time you press and release that button, you get a one sent to the processor. Let's extend that pipeline with some different types of black boxes. Let's take a black box that can remember how many times it's been called, and then we effectively get a button that counts how many times it's been pressed. Is that useful? It's interesting, but if we then do something like that with another type of black box that takes the output from the counting box, but then wraps round after it's got to a certain figure, say three, then we get something whereby every time you press that button, what gets sent to the app is a one, then a two, then a three, then a one, then a two, then a three, and we get a circular repetition. Now, that's useful in all sorts of scenarios. Um, and we'll come on to some real world applications where these things are useful in later videos. But for the moment, building on the debounced function, by using this pipeline concept, we can get some pretty powerful input methods. So this is such a common pattern that it's got its own name. We call it a tactless. That's just my little joke. It was a tact button, which went up and down. Now it only goes <laughs> down or up. So it's tactless. But that's a single stab function, okay? The counting button exists as a counting button, and the circular button also exists. These are all things that you can call in your code like you do a debounced or a filtered. Now then, think of a circular button that counts from 0 to 1. It's what's known as a latch. Press it once, you get a 1. Press it again, you get a 0. Press it again, you get a 1. Press it again, you get a 0. It's like a flip-flop flips between two states. That is a debounced circular counter with a count of two is a latch. And you see by building these things together we get some quite quite sophisticated functions. Now then think of a tactless button <coughs> that passes its output to something which can take the time it was pressed and then take the difference in the time every second time it gets called. It's called a timed button, and that will tell you how long the button was held down. And once you've got one of those, it can pass its output to a thing which repeats sending the output for a, if the button is held down for a, a, a longer time. 
So for example, the repeating button could send you a message one second, two second, three second, four second, if that timed button is sending it figures showing that it's still being held down for that length of time. And that then leads to what's known as a multi-stage button. Because if you give that a block of data, which we will call a stage map, which says after one second, call this function, after two seconds, call that function, after three seconds, call that function, then you can build up a very, very sophisticated pattern of different functions, depending on how long you hold that button down. Which leads us on to a thing you'll see in almost all of the sketches when we get to Wi-Fi called a multifunction button, which is a multi-stage button with predefined actions for a short press, which is less than a second. Oh, sorry, I think it's less than two seconds. A medium press, which is two seconds, but not exceeding five seconds. And a long press, which is over five seconds. And on a short press, it just turns the thing on. On a medium press, it reboots the thing. And then on a long press, it factory resets the thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And all of those come in a pipeline hierarchy from the starting point of being able to have a debounced input. Now, for reasons which, again, are partly due to my strange sense of humour, this whole process I call node pink. Now if you know node red, you'll understand why I do, because node red is a wonderful piece of software used in IoT and MQTT messaging systems, which works by passing messages from one node to the next in a flow, much in the same way as our pipeline does. But obviously that's a fabulous, complicated, marvellous piece of equipment, so mine's a diluted tiny version of it hence pink but um, it enables us to do some quite clever stuff with things like encoders for example which need two pins to operate on we have two flows we then have another flow which joins them together so each of those is called a half encoder both of them have got to be debounced you've then got to work out the pattern of movement between the two to work out the rotation and then you spit out a plus one or a minus one depending on whether it's been turned clockwise or anti-clockwise you can feed the output from that into something a bit more clever that holds a minimum and maximum value and an increment value and it on the minus one, it will take one off the current value. On the plus one, it'll add one to the current value. So you get an absolute encoder that knows its own value. And every time you turn one way or the other, it will just spit out the new value of the decoder to your code. One line of code is all it takes then to have a, an encoder feeding you a changing value based on the initial values you give it. We're going to look at encoders completely in a separate video later. Today we're going to look at the children of debounced. Here's the plan. We are going to use the tactless stabbing switch to cycle the on-offness of the LED. We've got one, two, three on the traffic lights, the built-in one on the uh, on the ESP, and we're going to press the button. It's going to cycle those lights around. So that's why we've got, looky here, that's why we've got a table. It's a standard vector. If you're not used to using them, don't worry. It's just like an array on steroids, but it's an array that can hold anything. What it's holding is an output pointer, an object pointer times four, one for each of the colored lights. Red on six, D6, yellow stroke amber on D7, green on D8, and the built-in on... Uh, well, whatever it is, D2, I think. So what we're going to do is every time that we get the stab, we're just going to increment a number. It's called here, count. It's a static uh, property of the GPIO routine. 
Here we are, look, starts out at zero. And every time we get a pin message, we're going to increase the count. Now then, we know how many LEDs we've got. So if we take what's called the modulus of um, the number, we will get a number between 0 and 4, i.e. 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, which we can use as an index into the LEDs. What we have up here is a plug-in called the pin machine. And that is the thing that controls all of the GPIOs. And the reason we've got that is because we want to do this. It's got a function in it which basically turns off everything all at the same time. Or it could turn them all on at the same time. But what we want to do to save us having to work out which was the last one on and then switch that one off and then switch the current one on. Simplest thing to do is when we get a message in from the stabbed button as we just turn all the LEDs off, we crank up the pointer, allowing it to wrap round each time, and then we turn on that LED. Now here's another beautiful example of why using the logical system is very useful, because the three LEDs on the traffic light are active high, by nature, because of the board it's built into, the built-in is active low. But still, on all of them, because the output normalizes them to all behave in the same way, we're always going to be turning on the relevant LED. So let's see that in action. There we go. Stab, 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 stab. So with very little code, we've got... Some interesting stuff happening. Just before we move on, um, of course, we also have the um, global event handler, but you've seen that a million times. I'm just keeping that out of sight so we can concentrate on the real code. <coughs> Excuse me again. So there we see how the tactless button is useful. But don't forget that the tactless button can feed into the counting button, can't it? And the counting button would then do the counting for us. So we wouldn't have to do some of this stuff in the loop. So let's just see what that would look like. OK, we have changed the um, we've changed the input type to be a counting now. And we've taken the counting out of our own loop. So all we've got to do, basically, is take whatever value comes in from the count, take the current modulus of how many LEDs we've got in the array, uh, and turn on the appropriate array. So let's have a look at that one working. No great surprise. Works exactly the same way. Look, stab, 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 stab. Just we've got a different thing driving it in the pipeline less code of our own in the main loop but we can do better than that can't we because we've got a thing that called a circular button which will automatically do that thing where it works out what the next number is in a circle so we could change that counting for a circular with four and it will count one two three four one two three four and as long as we subtract one from the value each time to make it naught to three for that array then we can just use the value directly. Uh, let's have a look what that looks like. And finally, as they say, we have now our circular button. And that has to have... Oops, I've used the wrong one again. Sorry. That has to have the uh, the count. Now that counts from one to four. So when we use the value, we have to take one off it in the loop to make it match. But by using LEDs size, uh, if we ever change the, the number of LEDs we've got, then the code still works. Um, and there's another little quirk in here, which we'll talk about another time. Um, but for the moment, here we have the counting function doing the same thing. So there we are. 
Um, you now know what we mean when we talk about node pink. Uh, and in the next video, we'll look at the other children of debouncing that are related to the timed functions. And then in the video after that, we'll look at how to use rotary encoders. And by the end of that, we will have done almost all of the GPIOs. We just need to look at the polling uh, methods and the analog methods, and then we'll be done. Thanks for watching this. As always, do all of the YouTube -y things, you know, um, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell notification icon. Because here's the thing that other channels don't tell you. Every time you don't do all of those things, a chip lets out the blue smoke somewhere.